All right, if you have your Bibles, if you hold them up, let's pray. Father, we come holding your word high and exalting it this morning. Lord, we come today to hear a word from you, and we pray that you would speak to us from heaven through your word. Lord, help us to be a people that are content and thankful. Lord, help us to be that as a light into the world. And Lord, we pray that you would be with us this morning, and that you would change us as we leave. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, we're actually going to take a, a, a small break from, uh, from our study in 1 John. Uh, probably won't be back in 1 John until maybe the beginning of the year. Uh, but we're going to actually be in Psalm 107 this morning. So if y'all would join me there in Psalm 107. And we get ready this week for Thanksgiving. And, you know, thankfulness, Thanksgiving, is an extremely important element to the life of a Christian. Um, it is extremely important, not for just for this time of year, but for, for all year, right? For all of our life. It shouldn't be Thanksgiving, it should be Thanksgiving. And that should be uh, how, how we are as Christians. And this is actually a good time of year to stop and reflect on that element because it's so important to the life of a Christian. Um, just to kind of give you an example from Scripture of how important this is, uh, two quick Scriptures. The first one is in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and Paul says this, he says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. It is the will of God for us to be thankful and to give thanks. What's more important than doing and living the will of God? What's more important than that? And Paul says that being thankful is the will of God for us. The other scripture is found in Romans 1, and it tells us that unthankfulness actually leads to idolatry. Paul says this in Romans 1, starting at verse 20. He says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. So they were that excuse. In other words, people see the creation, and so they know that there is a Creator. They can see that there is a powerful God out there because the creation itself exists. And then he says, But they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image like a corruptible man of birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. He says, that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. He says they weren't thankful. He, he adds that in there with not glorifying God. That's how important of an aspect thankfulness is. They didn't glorify God as God. They worshiped the creation instead. It, isn't it amazing that he adds thankfulness in there with that? That's how important it is. That these people would, would worship the creation itself. They would thank the river for the water and they would worship the sun for the, the warmth that it brings. But they wouldn't worship the God who created it. And, you know, it's not even, it's really not that different even in our scientific age today, right? It's, it's not that different. They may not bow down and worship the water or the sun, but they still claim that the, the universe and the, and the creation is self sufficient and that if there is a God, He's some distant God that's way off because He's wound everything up and it runs like a clock. That He isn't involved in His creation. That there's a bunch of laws and atoms that make the world work. But, and we've under, we come to understand how rain clouds work and how storms form. And so because of that, we become tempted to not be thankful to God and to pray to God for the rain. Right? Because we understand how it works. And so this is kind of the same idea. Unthankfulness. And it leads to idolatry. And Paul makes clear these two scriptures that thankfulness in the life of a Christian is extremely important. When we complain and grumble and murmur, we are literally out of the will of God and on the pathway to idolatry. So either, um, th there are two reasons that this leads to idolatry. One is um, because when we complain about things in our life, what we're essentially saying is either I deserve more than what God is giving me, or God doesn't know as good as me what I need, right? I know better than Him. That's idolatry. Another reason that that's idolatry is, uh, is because what we're essentially saying is God doesn't have the power to change it. We're complaining about it because God can't do anything about it. Both of those are false ideas about God. And so the question is, is what's the solution? How, how can I be a thankful person? How can I be less complaining? Well, the answer to that is found in Psalm 107, which is where we're going to be at this morning. Now this one psalm is actually part of a group of psalms, Psalm 105, 106, and 107 actually go together. They're a trio. They're meant to be read and sung together. Um, they all start the same way, and they all have one point, to, to bring God's people to praise Him and to give thanks to Him for all of the things that He does and for who He is. And if you actually wanted to get an overview of the history of Israel, you can actually read those three psalms, and it's a really concise overview of the Old Testament. Um, but this psalm, 107 particularly, 
is called what is what's called a post-exilic psalm, which means it was written after the Jews came back from exile in Babylon. They came back to the Promised Land, and then they wrote this psalm. And we've already read some of this psalm a little bit this morning, but uh, I'm going to just read the first three verses now because it is a long psalm. Um, but we are going to work through the whole thing. So if you can, stand with me as we read the first three verses of Psalm 107. God's Word says, O give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands from the east, from the west, and from the north, and from the south. You can be seated. Now I'm going to make a disclaimer before we really dive into this. Um, we're going to spend a good portion of time in the first couple of verses. Okay, So don't get scared when you we've been here for 15 or 20 minutes and we're still on the first verse or two. All right? Because we're going to go through the whole psalm, but the rest of it moves pretty quickly once we get the foundation laid in these first couple of verses. So don't, don't panic on me. So this psalm begins by calling us to give thanks to the Lord. But he, he goes beyond just saying we should be thankful to God. He gives us the very heart of the reason for why we should be thankful. He says, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. We should give thanks not just for what God does, but thankfulness actually starts with who God is. Understanding who God is, that He is good. The goodness of God is an amazing truth that we need to, to wrap our minds around, that we need to get in our hearts, because that's the start of thankfulness. And that's actually the first thing in your bulletin. Be thankful for who God is, not just what He does. That's the first step in being thankful. Knowing who God is and that He is good. That all of those hard circumstances and difficult trials that we go through in life are actually under the care of our good God. They are all in His hand and in His control and His power. This attribute of God is the very core of who He is, right? We would say God is love, God is holy, and we would say God is good. It is a core attribute of who He is. In fact, in Exodus 33, if you remember the passage when Moses is on the mountain before the Lord, and he says, I want to, he says, show me your glory, right? And God says, you can't see my face or you'll die. And so he says, but I'll show you part of my glory. I'll show you my back. And the Bible says that when he comes by, it says that God says, I will let all my goodness pass before you. And that shows us that the glory of God and the goodness of God are, are the same. They're, they're connected to each other. And so that's how essential the goodness of God is to his character and who he is. That makes God worthy of our praise and of our thanksgiving. Now, there are some people today who doubt the goodness of God. They doubt it. They, they will claim that if God is good, then why do bad things happen? Right? Or they'll ask the question, if there is a God, He must be evil, because only an evil God would allow for evil to be in the world. And the atheistic world mocks Christians and say things like, uh, God cannot be both good and all-powerful, because an all-powerful good God would stop evil. Right? He would stop uh, rape and murder and all of these things. So God can't be all-powerful, or He can't be good. But that's a very narrow view of, of God. The God of the Bible is, in fact, all-powerful, and He is good. In fact, this is what this psalm is going to teach us. You see, I'll give you a little philosophy really quick and answer those two questions. If God were evil, then He wouldn't allow for there to be good in the world. An evil God won't allow things like love. He wouldn't allow things like kindness and goodness. God is good. That's why we can look around at the creation and we can see variety and beauty and we can see things like kindness and love and goodness because God is good. But then that brings up the question, well, what about evil, right? Then why is there evil? Well, there are two reasons for that. And the first one is essentially because God is good, He gave man the ability to choose. He gave us free moral agency. And men chose evil. Evil is essentially the absence of the goodness of God. That's what evil is. And so men chose that rather than to serve God. And so that's what brought evil into the world. And the reason that God hasn't destroyed the world and stopped evil is because He's good. It's because He's good. He's giving us an opportunity to repent. He's giving us an opportunity to come back to Him. Right? Because think about it. If God was to come and He was going to eliminate evil, if he was going to do it right now, he's not just going to do it at the rape level or the murder level. God is so good, he's going to go to the lying level, to the thinking level, to the intention of our heart. Jesus said that God sees lust as adultery, which means God would come and he would eliminate you and me and everyone else. But it's actually the goodness of God that causes him to 
patiently endure our wickedness right now, giving us an opportunity to repent. That's what Peter says in 2 Peter 3, nine. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness. Some men say that God is slack concerning His promise, that He's not going to do anything. He says, but He is long-suffering, He is patient to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We, we see a picture of this in uh, the days of Noah. The wickedness of man had filled the earth, right? And God was going to destroy the earth in a flood. And the Bible says that He waited patiently for 120 years while Noah built that ark. That's the goodness of God. And He was giving men a chance to repent. In fact, um, in January, we're going to go th- start going through the book of Genesis on Wednesday night, and I'm going to show you when we get to Noah's flood why there's actually more room in the ark than what people want to claim. And it was because God is trying to give men an opportunity to repent. God is good, and He is full of mercy and kindness. He expresses His love not just to believers, but even towards the wicked. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, Jesus said, He makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. He allows unbelievers to experience things like love and marriage and children and to travel and see His beautiful creation, to have luxury and to enjoy uh, pleasure and delicious food and enjoyment. It's not just the Christian farmer who gets rain, right? But even the pagan tribe that worships uh, false gods. He sends rain to them because He's good. So when people in the world claim that God is not good, it's totally unfounded. We encounter the goodness of God everywhere we turn. I mean, the very fact that we're even still alive on this planet and allowed to live here is a testimony to the fact that God is good. And that's what the psalmist says. He says God is good for His mercy endures forever. He's giving us mercy to even let us be alive. Mercy is not getting the thing you deserve. We deserve judgment because we've sinned against God. But yet He allows us a wide variety of colors and sunsets and birds and and all of the fall leaves and beautiful music and to enjoy all of these things that, that are in this world. They're all a testimony screaming to the goodness of God. In fact, the Bible points out that God is so good that He even provides for the food for the animals. He provides for the animals. Jesus said that He even notices when one sparrow falls to the ground. In Matthew 6, 26, Jesus said, Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He feeds them. Our God is truly good. He is the source of all good things. And God delights in lavishing good gifts on His creation. He doesn't ration out His goodness. He lavishly and richly blesses His creatures out of His goodness. Psalm 145.9 says, The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. To which our response should be to give thanks to Him and to worship Him. We should thank Him for who He is, because He's worthy. And you, Christian, have been called to serve this wonderfully kind and gracious and good God. What in the world do you have to complain about? What do you have to grumble about? Is He not better to you than you deserve? Does He not give you more than you deserve? Our response should be thankfulness, delight and joy in praising Him, because He is worthy, because He is good. But we're not just asked... To, to give mental assent to the fact that God is good and to give thanks. Look at verse 2. He says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Those of us who have been redeemed, we should proclaim the goodness of God. We should say so. We should say that the Lord is good. We should thank Him. We should express our thanksgiving in the words that we say. When a sports team does good, we, we talk about it, right? When we watch a good movie, we talk about it. When we read a good book, we talk about it. Should we not talk about how good our God is and how good He has been to us and what He has done for us? In fact, the gospel itself, that word gospel means good news. It is the good news about the goodness of God and what He's done for us in Christ. The redeemed of the Lord should not be a bitter people or a complaining people. We should be a content, thankful people. Now, the the original point of this psalm was to call the people of God, the people of Israel, to worship God and to give thanks to Him after they were brought out of exile. That's the point of this psalm, is to remind them this is what God has done for you, and so you need to praise Him, and you need to thank Him for that. But the picture, the ultimate picture, just like everything else in the Bible in the Old Testament, points forward to the ultimate redemption that's found in Jesus. We have been redeemed from humanity's exile in sin, 
and brought into a kingdom. Paul says in Colossians 1, 13 and 14, who had delivered, talking about God, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. He says that we have been brought out of exile and into a great kingdom, a grand kingdom. And then in verse 3, he talks about how they've been gathered out from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and the south. Now in a small picture, that's the people of Israel. They were scattered over the earth and then God brought them out of exile and back to the promised land. But in the larger picture, we understand that there is a greater kingdom than just the kingdom of Israel. There is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ. And in that kingdom, God will bring out people from every nation and tribe and tongue. He will bring them from the east and the west and the north and the south to bring them into one kingdom. Right? That's the picture we get in Revelation 7 when, Paul, when uh, John says that he sees the multitude gathered around the throne from every kindred and tongue and people and tribe. That's the goodness of God that every people group will be represented in the heavenly choir. But let's not be narrow here. Um, we're not just to give thanks for who God is. That's, that's the first part. But we are to give thanks for what God has done, for what He has done for us. And that's actually number two. We should give thanks to God for His work of salvation. This is the second key to being thankful. Remembering what God has done for you. How He has saved you. We need to remember what He's done and we need to thank Him for that. We need to learn from the past that God has worked before in our lives and He will do it again. That He has saved us and He has adopted us as our own. Not to forsake us, but to work in us and make us better. I mean, where would we be if it were not for Christ? Where would you be if it wasn't for the cross? I know where I would be. I would be lost. I would be wandering in this world aimless. I would be in bondage to my sin. I would be in constant distress because who's in charge anyway, right? I wouldn't know. And I would have no hope as I suffer through the trials and the difficulties and the tragedies of life. It's truly only those who know Christ, only those who have been redeemed by Christ can rejoice in trials and suffering. Because we're the ones that understand that it's ultimately all for the glory of God. And that God brings us through those difficulties to make us into the image of Christ. But if there is no image of Christ that I'm being formed into, then it's meaningless. If there's no glory for God, then it's meaningless. And that's the way the lost world lives. They have no hope in the difficulties of life. And so we need to remember, we need to look back on what God has done for us and remember. And be thankful. The first section, uh, letter A, is this. He saves the lost. And we see that in verses 4 through 9. The, the people of Israel had wandered in the wilderness. They had, they had been sent out into exile. And they were hungry. They were thirsty. Verse 5, their soul faints in them. But then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them in their distresses. He saved us. He saved us when we were lost, and He brought us out. Our good God is our guide. He is our shepherd. Psalm 37, 23 and 24, it says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him in his hand. Our good God, our good shepherd, he holds us in his hand and he leads us and he guides us. He leads and protects his people because we're his children. He leads us through the Holy Spirit. He's given us his word that's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. He gives us access to come to him in prayer and he promises to answer our prayers when we ask. These are all amazing promises of the goodness of God, a testimony to His love for us. Now, people in the world, the lost people, they'll claim that, many of them, that they still have a purpose. And in, in one sense, they do have a purpose. They work their jobs, or they try to become famous and try to make a great name for themselves. They try to become wealthy, or try to retire earlier. All these things, they, they live for these purposes. But they're ultimately going to end. They're, they're not a lasting purpose. And all of those things ultimately are vain. It's like chasing after the wind. It's meaningless. Because only that which is done for Christ will last. Ultimately, those in the world, their, their soul faints in them. They're hungry and they're thirsty. The lost in the world, they search the world over for a thing that will satisfy them. Grasping for it. God has saved us out of that. He has saved us out of our aimless wandering. And He has given us purpose. And He has given us a reason to live. And just like He did for Israel, He brings us to that point so that we'll call on Him. 
We'll cry unto Him in our trouble, and He can deliver us out of our distress. And then He takes us and He puts us on the right path. That's what it says in verse 7. He led them forth by the right way, that they might go to the, a city of habitation. And that's where we're headed, right? To the new Jerusalem, a city of habitation. A city whose builder and maker is God. He has saved us. Has He saved you this morning? Has He redeemed you? Are you walking with God? Has He given you purpose? Then praise Him. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. But He not only saves us, He satisfies us. In verse 9, He doesn't just give us a purpose, but He satisfies our longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. He satisfies us. He could just save us and take us to heaven immediately, but He doesn't do that. He gives us a purpose. And then while we're walking and searching out that purpose and living out that purpose, He satisfies our soul. The next thing He does, letter B, He frees those in bondage. He frees those in bondage. Israel was captive. In verse 10, they were in a dark place, in a shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they had rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. That's us. That's where we were. We were living in darkness. We had rebelled against the commandments of God. We had spurned His, his Bible, His Word, and not listened to what He said, and not listened to His counsel. And because of that, we were in bondage to sin. But when we cried out to Christ, He freed us. He broke those chains. He brings us to that place. In verse 12, He brought them down so that they fell down where there was none to help. He brought them to the end of themselves, to the point to where they knew that they couldn't help themselves, so that they would cry out to God. And He does the same thing in our lives. He brings us to the end of ourself, because that's where we find Christ. And so because of these circumstances in our lives, He uses them to break us so that we call on Him. Right? They cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and He saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness in the shadow of death, and He broke their bands asunder. That's what He does for us. He breaks our chains. He breaks the bondage of sin. This is one of the greatest truths of our salvation. It's not just that uh, God is one day going to save us from the presence of sin, but that He is currently right now, through the power of the Holy Spirit in us, He is freeing us from the power of sin. He is giving us victory over it. Who the Son sets free is what? Free indeed. Jesus has broke those chains. And so if you're saved, if you've been set free in Christ, what do you have to complain about? What else do you need? Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Letter C is the next one. He, he delivers those in distress. He delivers those that are in distress. He's delivered you in your hour of distress. He's comforted your heart in difficulty. Have you ever gone through a trial or heartache and had the Lord there to comfort you? Had the Holy Spirit comfort your heart? Now, verse 17, he says, fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. We see this all the time, right? People are foolish in their actions and then they have to take the consequences of those actions. They make bad decisions and they have to reap the consequences of it. And God allows for those things to happen. And He even brings us to the point of verse 18, that their soul abhors all manner of meat and they draw near unto the gates of death. They, they despair of life. You get to the point to where you, you've, you've messed your life up so bad and you get to the point of absolute despair and there's nothing you can do to fix it. And cry out to God and He hears us. He says that, verse 19, they cried unto the Lord in their trouble and He saved them out of their distresses. He sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Isn't that what God has done for us? We made a wreck of our own lives and then God came and He saved us and He brought us out of that distress and He spoke the Word and He healed us. We can ultimately have hope in this because we know that ultimately, even in those difficult, despairing moments, that God is working all things to our good, right? Romans 8.28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. So even when we face trials and storms, we should look to heaven to find our security and our rescue. And we should thank God for the dark days because it's on those days that we learn to look to Him. And we should thank God for that. We should look back on those days and be thankful. Letter D, 
The next thing, He rescues out of the storms of life. He rescues out of the storms of life. He's rescued you before. He's brought you out of trials that you face. Now we know that God is actually in charge of all the earth, right? That there is nothing that happens in this world that God is not in charge of. One leaf doesn't fall to the ground without God knowing. And so when we see the the wonderful works of nature, we shouldn't credit Mother Nature, but Father God, right? And that's what He's giving us a picture of here in verse 23. They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. These are sailors, right, is is the, the picture He's giving us. It's a metaphor. And he's saying these sailors, they go down, they get into the ship, and they go out to the ocean, and they, they look around, and they see the wonders of God's creation. And it's evident that there is a God. But then he commands in verse 25, and raises the stormy wind which lift up the waves thereof. They mount up the heavens, they go down again to the depths. Their soul was melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man, and are at their wits' end. In other words, there's a, there's a huge storm. And they're on the ocean, and there's this giant storm that comes, and they get to their wits' end, they think they're going to die. They get to the point of despair in the storm. And so what do they do? Verse 28, they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and He brings them out of their distress. He makes the storm calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then they are glad, because they are quiet. So He bringeth them out into the desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt Him also in the congregation of the people and praise Him in the assembly of the elders. The psalmist is is painting a picture for us here. If God is powerful enough to stop a storm, to steal the sea, is He not powerful enough to rescue us in the trials of life? To bring aid in our hour of need? This isn't just for sailors on the sea. Right? This is... If He's able to do that, then surely He can reach down in my trial and my difficulty and my despairing moment and He can rescue me. He promises to do that. Psalm 91.15 He shall call upon me and I will answer Him and I will be with Him in trouble. I will deliver Him and honor Him. Number three. The third thing. We should give thanks to God for His powerful reign. We should give thanks to God for His powerful reign. This is the third key. Remembering that God is on the throne and that He is ultimately working all things out for the good. That we have a hopeful expectation for the future because our God reigns. God is powerful. And we should be thankful to Him for that. That nothing in life is random. There is no random chance. Our good God is in control of every circumstance that comes into our life. And they are all there by design. It's for our good. So the next time you're in despair and you're going through a trial and you're tempted to complain, you're tempted to lose heart, remember that you are in the hand of your good God and that He has brought that there for a reason. That He's in charge. Now this includes things that we don't normally see as good. In verse 33 he says, He turns rivers into wilderness and the water springs into dry ground. A fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. This is a picture of God's judgment. God's judgment on sin. Now it's, it's pictured here as God withholding rain from heaven and causing a drought, right? Drying up the river. It's a temporal judgment from God. He does the same things today. Don't, don't mishear me on this. But in the Old Testament, typically the blessings and the cursings of God were very temporal. They were very uh, physical in the world, right? He, he promised Israel if they followed Him that He would bless their land that He would give them bountiful harvest, that their, their flocks wouldn't, uh, wouldn't miscarry, and all of those things. But in the New Testament, the promises are eternal in nature. We're promised great blessings in the future life, right? In the afterlife. And so we're not so concerned with the temporal things. Now, we should still pray to God and bring blessing on crops and rain from heaven and all those things. That's true. But ultimately, this is a picture of God's judgment. This is a picture of His judgment. And the psalmist in this psalm is pointing out the most obvious, tangible thing and way that God judges men. And he's calling our attention to it. And he's saying we should be thankful to God because He brings judgment. And that's letter A. We should thank Him for His judgments. The reason this helps us to be thankful is because we know that God is good. And that means He's always going to do what is right. 
when those people persecute his people, when they persecute Christians, there's coming a day where they will answer for that. When men do wicked things, there's coming a day where they will answer for that. When we see the judgment of God against wickedness, we should rejoice in His justice and His goodness. The fact that God is good means that He's going to do right. That's what Abraham asked. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Yes. And when we see that judgment, we should thank God for it because His justice and His goodness has been served. But, because God is good, even when He brings that judgment, there's also mercy. He's slow to anger. And He's full of compassion and mercy. He's gracious, even to the wicked. And He gives them opportunity to repent. And when we do repent, He shows us more grace and restores what was lost. Look at verse 35. This is the opposite. He turneth the wilderness into standing water, and dry ground into water springs. And there He makes the hungry to dwell, that they may prepare a city of habitation. And sow the fields and plant vineyards which may yield fruit and increase. He blesseth them also so that they are multiplied greatly and suffereth not their cattle to decrease. He reverses. He restores. And that's letter B. We should thank Him for restoration. Not just in the physical sense. Not just in the physical sense that you know, we lose our, our house or our car and then God restores that. That may happen. Ultimately, God is going to restore all of creation back to what it's supposed to be. Right? He's going to restore us into a perfect kingdom. You see, thankfulness lives in the heart that is set on eternity. Thankfulness lives in the heart that is set on eternity. We look ahead with hopeful expectation to the day when creation will be restored. Which leads right to the next part of the psalm. In verse 39, he says again, they are menaced and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. He poureth contempt upon princes and causes them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. He setteth he the poor on high from affliction and maketh him families like a flock. The righteous shall see it and rejoice and iniquity shall stop her mouth. In other words, God's going to make all things right. He's going to take those that suffer and He's going to bless them in the next life. Right? Jesus said that the meek shall inherit the earth. And that's letter C. We should thank Him now because one day He will make all things right. Don't despair when we look around and see the wicked prosper. When we see evil men who through corrupt means make themselves rich. Don't despair. We should know that one day He's going to make all things right. And it's not the rich and the powerful who inherit the earth, but the meek. In Psalm 37 it says this, it says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily you shall be fed. Delight thyself in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of your heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. And He shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgments as the noonday. He says, verse 9, For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. He is going to make all things right. And so we should look forward to that day with hopeful expectations that the judge of all the earth will do right. And that should give us hope. That should give us thankfulness. Even in the suffering and the trials that we face now. Because they're temporal. They're, they're only momentary. And one day, one day in the future, He is going to make all things right. And the last thing, number four. We should observe all the works of the Lord and learn of His goodness. That's the whole point of the psalm. And that's what he says in verse 43. He says, Whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. And he says, whoever is wise will observe this. They'll look around and they'll understand that God is good. They'll look around and they'll see what God has done for them in the past. And they'll remember and they'll be thankful. They'll look ahead because they know that God reigns. And they'll hold on to that and they'll cling to that. Don't be like the pagans and worship the creation. Or those in, in, in our day who, who credit everything to natural law. Look to God and trust in Him. Remember who He is and that He is good. And remember what He has done for you in the past and thank Him. And look forward to what He has promised that He will do. And know that He's with you. So don't be a fool. Don't be a complainer. Don't be unthankful. Rather, 
Give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank You and we praise You for all that You do for us, for Your goodness. God, we praise You for Your mercy that You have shown us in the past. Lord, that You sent Your Son to die on the cross in our place for our sins so that we could be forgiven and be made right with You. Lord, that You made it where it was no part of us that it was not of our works, it was not of our good deeds, it was not on how good we could be, but God, it was by faith that we simply trust You and cling to You and look to the cross and that You would save us. Lord, we thank You for that, that You've delivered us. Lord, we thank You that You reign. We pray that You would help us to have an eternal perspective, to look forward to the day, God, when You will make all things right, when You will restore this world to what it was supposed to be. Lord, help us to live with thankfulness in our hearts and contentment, to not be complainers and murmurers, but to be people of thanksgiving. Father, we praise you for all that you do for us. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.